But this week, we're continuing in 1 Corinthians. Jesus commanded us his final words with his disciples in the Great Commission were to share the gospel, to go into the whole world, and not just share the gospel, but disciple people. Teach them to become followers of Jesus Christ, to obey God's word, and to live to glorify him. It's more than just sharing the good news. It's making disciples. And we want to be known as a church that clearly teaches, preaches, and lives out the gospel. But what is the gospel? There are a number of different versions of the gospel that we hear today. Jesus obviously taught the real gospel, and the apostles did. But sometimes you can spot these slightly lesser than the whole gospel versions. The prosperity gospel wrongly teaches that God wants you supremely, most of all, to be happy, to be healthy and wealthy right here on earth, to experience all of those things and for your life to just be all that it could be. The easy believism gospel says, just believe in Jesus. You'll avoid going to hell. Isn't that great? You'll go to heaven. But don't worry about becoming part of a church. Don't worry about studying the Bible. Don't worry about getting too involved. You're covered. You're going to heaven. It's all good. Don't worry about reading the Bible and continuing to grow. Once saved, always saved. Some churches have preachers who claim to have a new message from God that came in a dream or a vision, and that's what they're sharing. They may have one verse that they read, but then the whole rest of the message is just something that came to them in the night. Those messages are not God's word, but just from their hearts or from whatever they had for dinner that affected their sleeping. This is God's word, and this is what we're supposed to teach, preach, obey, and follow. God said, don't add anything to this, and don't take anything away from this. We have God's complete revelation, and it is sufficient for everything we need. There are no new personal messages. Does the Holy Spirit prompt you to do things? Yes. As you read God's word, does he encourage you to reach out to a neighbor or call somebody he brings people to mind? That's not a vision. That's not something new. That is obeying God's word. So make sure that you're able to spot those things. I'm going to give you two harder versions of the gospel. And I'm just setting this all up to, to make an important point. Here's one that sounds really good when you first hear it. God is holy. We have all sinned, separating us from God. But God sent his son to die on the cross and rise again so that we might be forgiven. Everyone who believes in Jesus can have eternal life. We're not justified by works. We're justified by faith alone. The gospel, therefore, calls all people to just believe. An unconditionally loving God will take you just as you are. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but does that sound pretty good? Does it sound like it's covered a lot of things? Listen to this next version. God is holy. This is the eye reading chart. <laughs> this is on the website if you want to look at it later. Um, so just listen as I'm reading it. God is holy. We have all sinned, separating us from God. But God sent his son to die on the cross and rise again so that we might be forgiven and begin to follow the son as king and Lord. Anyone who repents and believes can have eternal life, a life which begins today and stretches into eternity. We're not justified by works. We're justified by faith alone. But the faith which works is never alone. The gospel, therefore, calls all people to repent and believe. A contra-conditionally loving God will take you contrary to what you deserve and then enable you by the power of the Spirit to become holy and obedient like his Son. By reconciling you to himself, God also reconciles you to his family, the church, and enables you as his people to repent together his own holy character and triune glory. 
So initially, that first version sounded fine until you hear the things that were missing from it in number two. The second one emphasizes repentance. It emphasizes serving Jesus as Lord. It emphasizes the believer's new status and inclusion and reconciliation to others in Jesus' church. The first one really does sound good, but it leaves a lot out. So when churches are focused only on reaching outsiders and getting them to pray a prayer, there's a tendency to move towards that number one version of the gospel. Make the gospel easy to accept without talking too much about submitting to Jesus as Lord, without talking a lot about having this covenant relationship with a church that's in authority over you, that you submit to, and that you ask for feedback from. Jesus didn't call people only to believe in him. He said, come follow me, become my disciple, walk the way I walk, live the way I live. To become a disciple, Peter warned us that even the demons believe in Jesus, but they don't follow him as Lord and Savior. So in number one, when a problem arises in the church, people want to simply love and accept everyone and everything. Picture Route 90 during traffic time. And this is going to be scary for a moment, but picture a friend of yours, maybe a family member, strolling down the fast lane away from traffic so that they're not seeing any of the cars behind them. As you're standing there on the side of the road, are you going to call out to them and say, look out, you're in danger? Or are you going to say, let them go their way? Who am I to tell them where to walk, what to do, how to live? I'm not supposed to judge anybody else. That's their thing. Let them do it. If I warned them and yelled and shouted and they looked my way and heard me say, oh, look out, there's traffic coming, would you just leave it at that? Or would you care enough to run out there, grab them, and pull them off the road into safety? If you were the one unaware of that danger, would you think that the person who just grabbed you and pulled you out of traffic was being judgmental and telling you where to walk and what to do? And you should just mind your own business. Who are you to tell me where to walk? I can do whatever I want. Or would you want to be warned? Would you want someone to care enough to go out of their comfort zone, go into danger themselves, and pull you to safety? This number two version of the gospel is a church lovingly watching out for its members, ready to help someone when they're in danger. And that is true discipleship. That's really discipling people to see them grow and avoid the dangers in life. And it's comes again from the word discipline. That's where disciple comes from. So if you're here for the very first time, this series, we're in 1 Corinthians. It's called Living in Light of Eternity. And the Apostle Paul is writing to a church just like ours, except it was a couple thousand years ago and it was all the way across the ocean in the Middle East. But they had problems just like we have today. They had problems with unity. They had problems with marriage. They had issues with sexual morality. They had problems with how do we use our spiritual gifts in ways that encourage other people and not make it just about me. And they needed to learn that everything that they did in the church and outside the church, all of it needed to be done in love with that as the motive, the underlying reason that you're sharing warnings with people. It's not to make them feel bad, it's to Warn them because you love them, you care about them. The Apostle Paul ends this book, and we're not there yet, but he ends with an encouragement that we have a home in heaven. Believers will spend the eternity with Christ, and that should impact the way we live today. Because if everything we're doing today is just about ourselves, then there's nothing waiting for us in heaven. Jesus is there, that's going to be awesome. But God talks about rewards. He talks about the things that we've done for Christ 
being rewards that we can turn around and honor and glorify God with. And that's weird for us to think about as Christians, like our motive is to get stars and stickers up in heaven, but God tells us that this is the reality. The things that we do for him are going to bring him more glory in heaven, and that's something we should be excited about. So in chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians today, the Apostle Paul is addressing some specific issues with a specific man. The last couple of chapters have been about unity and they've been generalities. Make sure you're not following the world's wisdom. Make sure you're following biblical reasoning and that you're thinking about what God has said. But now he gets really specific. And if you were this guy, can you imagine this letter being read to the church? Because everyone is going to know exactly who Paul is, gonna, is talking about. He doesn't name him. He does name other people, but we don't know this man's name, but it's a real person. And the question is, how should the church respond? We're hearing this message because it's the next chapter in 1 Corinthians. We don't have a discipline issue to deal with right now, but as we're listening as a church, as we're thinking about it, take some notes because there may come a time when we need to use this, and we want to know how God wants us to disciple and discipline members within our church. Paul is going to first define the problem. Then he's going to provide some specific action steps, things to take moving towards discipline. And then he provides the reasons for discipline so that we know when to act and we know why we are doing this. What's our motivation? So as I said, take notes. There's a place in your bulletin. There's an insert sheet there. And if you're watching online, you can go to faithlife.com slash Dunkirk Baptist, and that has all of the bulletin notes, the announcements, all of those things are there for you. So let's pray as we get ready to read God's Word. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this morning that we could come together and lift up the name of Jesus. Thank you that we could be reminded of your amazing grace, how much you care for us, and help us also remember, Lord, that we're called to follow you as our Lord and Savior. It's not just head knowledge, but it's heart determination that we know that you're our Savior, that we know that we've been forgiven, and that we choose to follow you, to live the way you do. Help us, Lord, to have hearts that are open to hear your word this morning, that we would allow your spirit to move and direct in our lives the things that need to change. And I pray, Lord, that we would go away with uh, a new desire to follow you even more. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to read all of chapter 5. It's only, verse, it's only 13 verses long, so follow along with me in your Bible, or you can follow on screen. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. 
not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. This is a tough chapter. There's a lot of difficult things in here. So we're going to go through it verse by verse. And first of all, we see the problem. Paul is shocked. It's actually reported. How can I be hearing this? Can I believe my own ears? I'm hearing this from other people. Why are you church leaders not asking me for help? Why am I hearing this from other people? There's sexual immorality in the church. The old King James Version used the word fornication, and that, along with sexual immorality, comes from the Greek word pornea, which refers to any sexual activity. It's where the word, we get the word pornography, which literally means visual sex. Paul says, a man has a sexual relationship with his father's wife, and you don't seem to care about it. So this is not the man's mother, otherwise he would have used the word mother, but it's the man's, the father's current wife. So it's his stepmom, and Paul is floored. Paul said, this man has his father's wife, which means it's ongoing. It's not just a fling or something that happens on vacation. It's a lifestyle. They've, they've somehow hooked up, and they're continuing to do that. And Paul said, even the pagans don't condone this. Even the unbelievers, the world says, this is wrong. The Romans had a law against incest. And you're tolerating this inside the church? How could you do this? Verse 2, he says, you're arrogant. You're boasting when you should be mourning. You should be upset about this. For the state of your church family, for the honor of Jesus Christ, for your testimony to the community, why aren't you mourning? How could you be boasting? So what were they boasting about? possibly Christian liberty. Maybe they're saying, wow, we're the cool church. Anybody can do whatever they want. We're protected by the blood of Jesus. People take Christian liberty and think they can go on and sin and do anything they want. Maybe that's what they were boasting. Did they think maybe that they're just being loving by simply refusing to act? Whatever it is, this church is in the wrong. And Paul says, you're ignoring Blatant, ongoing sin by a church member, and this is not okay. This is the problem. This particular instance is sexual immorality. It's not the only one that is a problem in the church, but it's the one that happened in 1 Corinthians. So if we had a church member who is openly, blatantly sinning in whatever area, and they don't care about it, and the church doesn't care about it, it's a problem. It's a problem. So what do we need to do? Here's the acts of discipline that Paul starts to outline. First of all, in verse 2, you should be mourning about this. It's not only a sin against this woman and the man's father, but by ignoring it, by condoning the sin, the church is saying, this is okay. Anybody can do this. Instead, you need to pronounce judgment. You need to call out this man and his sexual activity, and say, this is sin. This is not okay. Don't dismiss it. Don't ignore it. Recognize it as sin against God. And if you remember back to David's prayer of penitence, he says, against you and you only, God, have I sinned. He realized that his sin was so terrible. Yes, it impacted all the people around him, but it was a sin against a holy and perfect God. And he first needed that forgiveness from God. And then he needed to go deal with the people around him and seek forgiveness and restore relationships. If this was an area of Christian liberty, like in the Corinthian church, maybe keeping a kosher diet or observing certain holidays, then it wouldn't be a matter of church judgment. Those are things that individuals 
have soul liberty. We have the ability to judge what's right for us when the Bible doesn't say that thing is a sin. But sin needs to be judged as wrong by Christians. Things that God has said, this is a sin, we need to address it as a sin. And in verse, Paul, in verse 3, Paul says, I'm not even there, but I can clearly see that this is a sin issue that needs to be addressed. I've heard enough. As soon as someone said, this man has this relationship with his father's wife, there's no liberty issue there. There's not an okay if it's okay with his dad. This is sin, plain and simple, and you need to judge it. So what should you do? You need to remove this person from the church. They should no longer be in fellowship with the church. It doesn't talk about the woman. She's probably not part of the church. She may not even be a believer. But this man and his sin, because he's a member of the church, needs to be removed. And on what authority do we do this? First of all, Paul says, by my spirit, the authority of Paul's word, which for us today is scripture. This letter from Paul to the Corinthians was authority because he wrote it through the Holy Spirit in God's authority. And Paul says, I've made it clear what you need to do. So all of those letters being written to the early church and all of the New Testament books that we have now are God's word giving us the authority. When it says this is sin, then we can say it's sin. We're agreeing with God's word. And we have instructions to follow God's authority. Secondly, we have the authority of Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. And Jesus addressed this same issue. He was talking to his disciples back in Matthew 18 before the church even started. And he uses the word church. There isn't even a church yet. They're still worshiping at the temple. He hasn't died. He hasn't risen from the grave. The church hasn't started meeting yet. But Jesus talks about what do you do when someone has sinned against you personally? What do you do? Well, first, you go to that person and say, here's a problem. What you did was sin, and you really need to repent of that. And if that person listens and repents, it's all good. That's great. You've not only gained a brother, you've strengthened that relationship, but you've helped lead him back to the right relationship and reconciled him with God. But if he won't listen to you, you don't go and talk to everybody in church and start saying, do you know what he did? Posting it on Facebook and making this person look bad and trying to get people against this man. You go to him with another brother so that with one or two people you could say, we are in agreement that what you're doing is wrong and you're not listening to brother Bob. So we've come with him to help you see that this is really a big deal. This is sin and it needs to stop. And if he listens to that group of men, praise God, he will reconcile with God, he can reconcile with the church, and that's great. But if he still won't listen, if he remains unrepentant, if he dismisses his sin, if he makes excuses for it and says, yeah, but this is just not convenient for me to do this, then you bring it before the church. And Jesus says, the church then will pass judgment and say, as a church body, we all agree what you're doing is wrong. Still with a hope that this person would repent and listen to all of the church and say, yes, I am wrong. I can't believe I've let this gone on so long. Please forgive me. Father, forgive me. Church family, forgive me. Desire for that person to be restored. That's what Jesus said. So he is backing up this principle. And then there's the authority of the assembled church. Paul said, go to the church. You have Jesus Christ's word. You have my word. You can deal with this. The church is supposed to deal with this. And in Matthew, at the end of his passage talking about church discipline... Verse 18 is usually misinterpreted. It says, where several people agree, God will too. 
And people say, oh, that's great. We've got prayer meeting. We've got at least three people. Now we can pray. But that's not the principle. It's saying that the authority of the church is when you're backed by Jesus Christ and you've gathered together and what you have binded or loosed in heaven is bound and loose here on earth as well. It's talking about someone being guilty or innocent. What you have said is right and wrong as a church with the Holy Spirit guiding you, with God's word guiding you, then those things are authoritative. You can act on them. So coming together with the word, coming together with Jesus Christ as Lord, coming together as a church, you have the authority to approach this person and say, what you're doing is wrong. It's a sin against God. It's a sin against this family. And it's a sin against the church and the community. You're dragging the name of Jesus Christ and the name of his followers through the mud. Stop doing this. Here's the tough part. Verse for when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and when my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. When it's talking about turning him over to Satan, it's talking about the world. Scripture tells us that this world is currently Satan's realm. He has the ability with his demons to impact people. The church is here, the Holy Spirit is here, and we're sharing the gospel, but right now, Satan is kind of wreaking havoc and all the sin and things that are happening around the world. So when he says, deliver him to Satan, he's saying, put him out into the world. Treat him as though he was an unbeliever. Put him outside the church. And this destruction of his flesh is not talking about Satan literally melting him or beating him up physically. His flesh is his sinful body. Paul talked a number, talks a number of times about us denouncing the flesh, our sinful desires, and putting on Jesus Christ. So what the hope in this putting someone out is saying, he's going to be out in the world and hopefully, he will denounce sin. He will denounce the things that he's been doing in the flesh, not obeying Jesus Christ. He's going to hopefully repent. Colossians 3, 5, Paul says, put sin to death. And Paul is saying, by taking this strong action of putting this person outside the church, it will be a wake-up call for him. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. That's Colossians 3.5. With the hope that there is salvation of his soul, if he repents, then we can see that he truly was a believer and his salvation will be apparent from all. He's not going to be saved because you kicked him out of church you're going to see if he comes back, then this person really was a follower of Jesus Christ. He's repented of his sins, and his salvation will show that. Colossians 3.10 says, And having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. The evidence of a repentant, saved person is that they're setting their minds on things above instead of focusing on and desiring things that are here on earth, things that are sin, saying no to sinful pleasure and saying yes to a changed heart and a changed mind. This is the ongoing sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus Christ one day at a time. Verse 11, Paul says, don't associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality, greed, being an idolater, reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, don't even eat with such a person. Again, he mentions this specific sin of sexual immorality because that's what this man is struggling with. But then he lets us know it's not just that. That's not the one sin that you kick someone out. It's someone struggling with sin and saying these sins are okay. Someone who's greedy. 
someone who is a reviler, a blasphemer, or an abusive person, someone who is a drunkard, can't control themselves, or a swindler who's cheating people. And again, he's just listing some of those examples to say, don't associate with these people if they call themselves brothers. This is 2023, so I have to say this. Brothers also means sisters because there's confusion with that. Occasionally, it's talking about a literal brother, but in this case, brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't associate with people who say they're followers of Jesus, but then just don't care about living a life to follow him. Verses 12 and 13 let us know that we shouldn't associate our fellowship with them if they're in continuous unrepentant sin. And Paul says, don't even eat with them. They should be purged, which means completely removed from the church family. And if you lived in this area long enough, you know that we have Amish neighbors, we have some Mennonites in the area too, and that's where they got the idea of shunning. And they're taking it from this biblical principle of you're no longer part of the church family. And they take it to another degree, which is don't say hi on the street, don't invite them to Christmas dinner. You know, as a family, cut them out of your lives. The scriptural example here is as a church family, this is what you should do. They should no longer be part of your fellowship. So it's someone who is continuing in sin, someone who's making excuses for their sin, someone who doesn't listen to correction, and they're clearly ignoring God's word. They should no longer be a member. And this is one of the passages that helps us understand that there actually is church membership. A lot of churches today just kind of say, if you show up, you're, you're part of us. And everyone that's here is welcome. Everyone in our community is welcome to come. But if you want to join and become a member, that's a deeper commitment. That's saying, I want this family of people to be my brothers and sisters, my mother and father. I want you to keep me on the straight and narrow. I want you to correct me when I'm wrong. I want you to encourage me when I'm low. That's church membership. Because you can't put someone out if they haven't joined, right? Otherwise, that would be me just pointing to someone in the pew and saying, leave. We don't want you here. If you haven't joined us, then you haven't announced that you're a brother or sister. You haven't said, I want to be part of this family. I want to follow Jesus with you. We have no place in kicking someone out if they've never joined. And again, kicking out is not the whole point of this. The point is repentance, restoration, seeing this person back following Jesus Christ. So what are the reasons for discipline? Sin impacts the whole church. This man who had a sexual sinful relationship with his father's wife was impacting everybody. The community knew about it. People in church knew about it. This woman, if she was not a believer, her family knew about it. And verse, verses 6 to 8, Paul uses the example of leaven, which is yeast, in a lump of dough. How many bakers do we have out there, out here? What does yeast do? Makes it rise. And what is it? What's yeast actually? It's a living bacteria, right? So you don't just put it in one corner and only that corner of the bread pops up, right? You put it in and it affects the whole dough. I'm not going to call you lumps, but that's what he's calling us, is, is a big lump, right? We're the, we're the lump. And when you add yeast to the lump and you knead it in, the whole bread is going to rise and it's going to be amazing and tasty. When does it show up? It shows up in Passover. When God said, I want you to clean out all of the yeast in your house. Every little crumb, every little bit of bread that could impact this special memorial service we're going to have. I want it all swept out. And even today, Jewish families do this. And the father ceremonially gets a feather and a little pan, and he scoops up the last couple of crumbs that mom left for him to find because dads are not usually good at finding dirt, right? We're not always the best cleaners. Some people are more fastidious than others, but 
That's part of their ceremony. We want to clean out all of the dirt. And they will actually throw out things in their cabinets if they haven't eaten them. Pop-tarts and cookies and anything with yeast still in them. They clean their house completely top to bottom. And they say, we're doing this because we want unleavened bread. We're going to have this part of, as part of the Passover because in that time when they're getting ready to leave Egypt, they didn't have time to wait for the bread to rise. So God said, I want you to have unleavened bread. Be ready to just take off. I'm going to free you from Egypt. So get rid of all of the yeast in your house and ceremonially continue to do that as a symbol of cleaning up your house, cleaning up your life. Is there sin in my life that needs to be removed because it's impacting me? It's affecting my relationship with my wife, my kids, people at work. Whatever this sin is, it's going to be seen and affect other people. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I want to be made whole and new again. So when we celebrate that, and we're still celebrating that festival today as communion, we have unleavened bread, and we have grape juice representing Christ's blood, and the bread which represents his body, and we take those and say, we're remembering this. We need to continue to repent. We've been forgiven of our sin. Jesus' death on the cross covered all of it, and it's his righteousness. But our sin impacts our relationship with each other, and it impacts our relationship with God. You're here this morning, so hopefully there's nothing big that you're struggling with, but there have been days that you may have stayed home from church and just said, I've had such a bad week. I've blown up at so many people. I've just had such a poor week as a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't feel like I should be in church. I feel like a hypocrite. I don't want to be there. Or there may be days where you have just blown it so bad that you say, I can't even talk to God. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to pray. My relationship with him has not been severed because he saved me. And it's his righteousness that saves me. It's not my works. But because there's sin between us, between me and God, I'm not coming to him humbly as a son or daughter and saying, Father, forgive me. I'm not going to you as a brother or sister and encouraging you in your walk when I'm struggling in my walk. So God says, repent. And if you ask for forgiveness, God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He wants us to do that continually, for that to be ongoing. At the end, he says, or not the end, I didn't write down where the verse is, but he said, we are like sincere bread of truth, not sinful, not filled with malice or evil, and our discipline, what we're doing for each other is done out of sincerity. We're looking for God's truth in the matter. We're not trying to just discredit this person. We're not trying to use political power to get them out of church. We're not doing it because we don't like something they did to our family, so we're being Hatfield and McCoy about this, we're doing this because in all sincerity and all truth, we want to see this person restored. We want to see their walk with God back again. We want to see their fellowship with each other back again. Um, Eerdman, which wrote a dictionary of the Bible, described this, the word excommunication. And we don't use that word in Baptist churches, but if you've said you're no longer a member, churches call that excommunication, no longer in communication. Church discipline, ending in excommunication, should only be used for serious matters such as blatant sexual sin, 1 Corinthians 5.1, unrepentance, Matthew 18, divisiveness in Titus 3, the propagation of heresy, teaching untrue doctrines, Romans 16, Sinners should be dealt with quickly and seriously for both the health of the community and the spiritual health of the offender. Verse 12 tells us that the church is only called to judge and provide discipline for believers, 
not unbelievers. Paul said, if you were avoiding everyone who sinned, you couldn't even live here on earth. You'd have to go somewhere else, like the moon colony, if that's coming. Maybe that'll be their marketing. Avoid sin, go to the moon. But guess what? As soon as you step off the rocket ship, there's sin, right? Because you just brought it with you. People looking for the perfect church, as soon as they walk through the doors, they've ruined it, right? We are all sinners, but we're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And our desire as a church family is to grow in our faith, not to just sit back and say, oh good, I'm going to heaven, I don't have to do anything else. James said, that kind of faith with no works, with no desire to please God, with no desire to impact other people, that kind of faith is what? Dead. Dead faith. Do you want dead faith? I don't. God is going to judge unbelievers. He looks at their hearts. He sees their sins, and he knows whether they've trusted Jesus as their Savior. So church, the only people that you're supposed to judge are the church family. They're the only ones that we have the right as a church to judge. So the churches that are out um, blowing up people like abortion clinics or picketing everything that they don't like, they really don't have a lot of biblical backing to do that. Can we make changes in our country? And can we write to our congressmen? And can we have uh, petitions and try to affect our culture? Sure. But it's not my job to go pointing my finger at everybody else and saying, sinner, sinner, sinner. I'm trying to not point at people. Sinner, sinner, <laughs> sinner. I don't want you to take, go home with that memory. Sinner, 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 right? That's not our job to point out people's sin. It's the Holy Spirit convicting someone. We share the gospel. We share the good news. We let people know what to do with your sin, how to have it forgiven, and how to follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Galatians 6.1, which Mike read for us, Brothers, if any one of you is caught in any transgression, any sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of angriness, divisiveness, no, a spirit of gentleness. And keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. This is a matter of humility saying, yes, we have all struggled, we have all sinned, but thank God he caused me to repent of this. Can I help you? Can I encourage you that you're... Your life can change. You can put this sin to death. You can change. The purpose of any kind of discipline is to prompt repentance and ultimately to see that brother or sister reunited with the church body. Being officially ostracized from the church, the hope is that that sinner might be brought to repentance. When they're sitting alone on Sunday morning, when it's the day of back to church Sunday, and they've got nowhere to go, they might say, hmm, I miss my church family. What have I done to cause me to get to this place? And obviously the Holy Spirit's going to be working too, but the effect of being told you're no longer part of this church family because you don't want to follow Jesus, that's going to impact somebody. And our desire is to see them come back. 2 Corinthians 5-8 through 8, says, show grace. It could be Paul addressing this same situation. We don't know for sure, but it sounds a lot like it. When someone has repented, show them grace. Forgive them. Comfort them. Reaffirm your love and care for them. And then welcome them back into fellowship. And that's what makes us think that Paul was addressing this same issue. It sounds like this worked. That they did put him out of the church and he did repent and he came back. God offers us forgiveness. He offers you a relationship, restored and clean and vibrant again when we repent. Sometimes we see people repent, return to fellowship, and then they fall again. Does that mean we just immediately jump on them and say, there you go, you're out again? 
if it's continual sin, if it's blatant, if it's unrepentant, if they're not willing to listen to anybody, then yes, you would have to repeat it. But we don't want to have a short list and just be ready to not give this person the benefit of the doubt, right? We want to see what's going on in their heart, talk to them about it. Because through this, we can demonstrate God's grace. We can show not only this person, but others that this is what it's like when God welcomes you. This is what it's like when God forgives you. You can be reconciled. So discipline really should be happening all the time. And I've said this a number of times. Discipline comes from the word discipling. The whole church should be encouraged that we are helping each other grow in our faith. That you're calling someone during the week and say, can we get together for a cup of coffee? Can we talk? Can I, how can I pray for you this week? How can I encourage you? What are you struggling with? And then when we hear someone's difficulties, to help them see from God's word, this is the way you should be thinking about this. This is the way you should be acting about this, the way God says in his word. Not just giving good advice, but giving godly direction. Speaking and acting like Jesus. And in all of these things, bringing God the glory. Showing the people around us what God is like. He is loving. He is forgiving. But he's also holy. He wants us to follow his son, to walk like him to encourage others to follow him as well. So as I said last week, if you don't have someone that you trust in your life that you could say, where am I messing up? What do you see in my life that needs to change? Or how do I deal with this problem? If you don't have someone like that, start praying about it and approach someone. Ask someone that you believe is spiritual and would be a good mentor for you. And then if you've been around for a while, look for people that you could be encouraging. Every one of us should have someone above and below us that we can talk to honestly and so that these issues are dealt with in those one-in-one -in -one relationships. We don't want to have a church discipline meeting every week. We don't want to have one ever, do we? We want people to be coming back, asking forgiveness, restoring their relationships right as they are happening. And that's the kind of church we want to be. We don't want to be the church where the gospel just says, it's easy, just come show up. Again, I love you being here, but if you want to join, I want to see you grow, and we want to challenge you to grow and help you grow. So some take-homes this morning. First question is, have you repented of your sins? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and have you submitted to him as Lord of your life? If you prayed once at Vacation Bible School when you were five years old and you've never followed Jesus since, then this is an opportunity to get serious about your faith, to really become a follower of Jesus Christ. If you have people in your life that have done that and you think, well, I'll see them in heaven because they prayed a long time ago, Scripture says there's going to be fruit, there's going to be visual things that we can see, signs of life that this person is a follower of Jesus. So don't write that person off. Keep praying for them. Keep encouraging them. But don't just say, oh, they're fine. Are they part of the church? Are they out worshiping? Are they reading God's word? Are they following Jesus day by day? We want to be encouragers like that. If you are a believer, as I said, have you submitted really to Christ as Lord of your life? It's one thing to say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. It's another thing to say, sign me up. I want to go through whatever tough things there are in front of me. Jesus lost a whole bunch of followers when he said, pick up your cross and follow me. This is going to be hard. This is not going to be easy, but it's worth it. Because as you do that, you're going to see not only your life change, but you're going to see other people's lives change. You're going to see other people in heaven as a result of you sharing the good news, sharing the gospel. So get serious about your walk with Jesus. And then if you haven't submitted yourself to a local church, I would encourage you to do that. This is a good one. I like this one. 
So if you want to join this church, I would encourage you to do that. But you need to have other people in your life that you're willing to say, tell me when I'm wrong. All of our deacons and former deacons who have met with me know that I've said that to them numerous times. I don't want you to just say, good job. I want you to say, eh. <laughs> I need to hear that. We all need to hear that, don't we? When someone says and is actually asking for affirmation, you can encourage them and say all the good things they did, but you can also say, but here's something. Here's something that you could be working on. When we give each other that permission, it's so much easier. And this is something that uh, has come up in marriage counseling, that you need to look to your spouse and say, you have permission to tell me when I've messed up. Please tell me when I've messed up. I need to hear that. Who better than your spouse than to tell you something hard? Do you want to hear it from your boss or your mother-in-law? Probably not. Hear it from the person that you know loves you, that you know cares about you, and then listen to it that way. Oh, this person who loves me and knows me better than anybody else just said, I messed up. I should stop making excuses and arguing and saying, yeah, I did. Forgive me for that. Help me. We need to submit not only to each other, to a church, to people who are willing to be honest with us. Church discipline is not always done perfectly because it's imperfect people doing it. But this is what God gave us. God gave us the church and said, I want you to go through life with other people. I want you to encourage other people and help other people. And if you've been hurt by this, I am so sorry. I've seen it done poorly and occasionally I've seen it done well. But it doesn't mean that we can ignore God's word. We have to be a church who disciples each other and is also willing to discipline. And as I said, I'm glad we're talking about this when nothing specifically of issue is going on right now, but we need to be ready. We need to be willing to have those conversations. And I hope you will ask God to not only be humble to hear them, but to be willing to have them. Mark's going to come. We're going to close in another song about grace. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for showing us goodness and unmerited favor when we don't deserve it. Thank you, God, for providing us with the institution of the church, giving us other people who love you and love us. Help us to grow as a church family, to be disciples who not only want to follow you, but are willing to encourage and correct each other. And I just pray, Lord, that as a result of this, we would have a greater testimony in this community. We'd have a greater testimony in the lives of our church members. And that not only would we see you glorified to the ends of the earth, but that we would see people desiring to know you, to be forgiven, and to become disciples of Jesus Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another in compassion. Agree with one another in unity. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.